It's been an interesting time taking a look into the various outcomes and abundant choices found in Baldur's Gate 3. It's both an intriguing title that's given players an immersive perspective into adventuring on the Sword Coast, and, as a friend of mine put it, a game that plays like crack. In a good way. Depending on where you go digging, how well you roll, and what you might uncover, there's lots of magic items, potions, and useful assets for your journey. I thought that this game would hold my hand throughout the adventure and prove to be quite devastating to my opponents, but after the beginning, lots of fights end up leaving me barely alive or fighting to end the encounter. Whether that be victory or escape, no shame in running. Either way, not all of the D&D 5e knowledge can help me for every last thing that this game could throw at me. That's why I wanted to make a video talking about this amazing new title today alongside my general thoughts of the game. So, mechanics. One thing I'll start off with is the shove action. In D&D 5e, as a special attack action, you can shove someone with contested rolls to make distance or knock them prone. In Baldur's Gate 3, unless I have a strong, brain-eating parasite as well, it's a bonus action to shove. I love this personally, as I can still use my attack action per the norm and help myself close some gaps more often than I ever thought I would. A bonus action seems to be the case for a few familiar choices such as dipping or jumping. For 5e, at least from what I understand, it doesn't cost an action of any kind to jump, and the factor used in jumping is how much movement speed you have to do so. So far, it's been the little things, like what I've noticed so far. Obviously, since the table and the video game are different in how things are done, there are things the developers would have to do to make things work for that specific platform. Otherwise, I might assume there would be issues in consistency or combat based on mechanics that work clunkily together in a real-time simulation of sorts. In this case, it all seems to make very good sense, and I find that it's rare I don't get to try what I want on my turn if I plan it right. Uh, and hit dice don't seem to exist in regards to making the choice to use them. I would say I don't like this normally, but with two short rests a day, hit dice quantity is found to be no hindrance if they exist in the background, and getting the durable feet on people that need to soak up damage helps out even more if you're prone to letting your short rests in. On an added note, I know some people might not like being stuck with two short rests a day, but I find that's usually all I need to do, even with warlocks and wizards and fighters in my party. The long rest is where it's at, man. How many naps do I really need a day, hard work or not? So far, that's what I can think of in regards to rule set differences. Some folks would point out that if your long rest is interrupted, you have to start over. If someone comes to visit you for a moment in camp, though, I don't see why a couple of minutes of being awake would ruin a long rest. With that, I'd say the video game version of the 5e rules are quite quality and well thought out. Each combat is a new experience with familiar monsters or new ones, and interactions actually matter. There are decisions to make, people to love or even hate, and countless allies and enemies waiting for you to do who knows what to them. Please don't get any ideas from the way I phrase that, and when you inevitably do, I won't be here to help you when you find the bear. I heartily believe that this is a wonderful way to introduce somebody keen on strategy games to D&D. Even as someone who prefers action or different forms of strategy when it comes to this medium, I can already tell you I've made at least four characters in the short time I've owned this game since its official release. With that being said, I think it's wise to let any gamer know that the board game is going to play a smidge different. Some things are just done differently, but in a matter where the same purpose can be achieved just with slightly varied forms of resources in order to do so. Some subclasses have been changed, and I've heard that Monk is perhaps better than it was in 5e. Since I've not played one yet, I cannot confirm this, but if they still function on the same principles, I'm sure what Larian has used to implement in this class is satisfactory. I'll have to experiment with that. For all of you that are interested in this game, it's definitely worth the money. I personally would love to see games like this hit the market more often prove that when no one's available for the fifth week in a row to start D&D for the next session, there's still a way to play D&D without having to wear the player's hat on top of the DMs. From what kerfuffle I've heard people in the game development industry make about the title and anything like it, I understand that the resources behind its creation are well suited towards a new and incredibly high standard, at least amidst a decline. Perhaps I'm ignorant how much truly went into this title or ignorant to games people compare this one to. 
I don't expect every indie game industry to turn out something of this exact quality, nor do I expect every single game to treat me like this one did. It's simply not meant to be. And when I say quality for indie games, I'm talking about something that would take years, if not maybe even close to a decade to emulate, considering the numbers, the people, the hardware, what have you. But if you can give me a well thought out and immersive experience in this format of gaming, then you'll have me returning for more. It's the many choices, the features, the spells, what could be, what might not be. The RNG or fate, as we'll call it. If there's an awesome experience and a way to make it my own when I play, we're already off to a good start. As an example, Pokemon has various options that can only be on your team if you want them to be, and of course, if the right conditions are in place. But let that be my way of saying, give me a way to make it my playthrough, not just a playthrough. In Baldur's Gate and D&D alike, you have your class, lineage, subclass, and additional classes if you're a jack of all trades. Not to mention the other party members you can switch out and find within certain parameters. With as many interactions as there are in Baldur's Gate 3, there's so many ways to involve yourself in things you're great at, or things that you're really not. The many successes or flops are with the group of folks you've chosen, and it adds together nicely for a story packed game, making me wonder. What did Gail want to show me after we said hello to an angry militia? What is the cleric hiding? Why is the barbarian so hard? With all that being said, uh, thank you for listening to my two cents. Have you played this title as well? What are your thoughts on this game and the depiction of the 5e rules? Let me know, and don't forget to fidget with the YouTube buttons that release the good chemical. In the meantime, good existence to you all, and if you'd like more Baldur's Gate 3 content, feel free to tell me in the comments. Take care!